Well, the way of the spiritual warrior, part two. Oh, I call it the red feather warrior. Long ago, it was possible for young warriors of the Plains Indian tribes to gain honor and respect by counting coups. There were four primary ways of, to accomplish a coup. You could touch an enemy, get out. Steal an enemy's horse, lead a successful war party, or capture an enemy's weapon. Of these, the bravest was to touch an enemy, not kill him, but touch him on the chest. A head and shoulder was also accepted, but it was more dangerous to touch him on the chest because you were closer in and he might have a chance to kill you. The goal was to get away without being killed. The more coup a warrior could score, the more glory and dignity he achieved. And often, the one with the most coup would become the chief of the tribe. Today it's not any easier to count coup for young Native American boys and girls. There are lots of enemies out there, especially on the, the reservation in particular. The young are faced with overwhelming odds. They frequently have to survive an absent father, an alcoholic mother, gangs, their own drug addiction, a jealous boyfriend or husband, tribal corruption, their own weaknesses, and too often brutal cultural clashes. Wireless. Wireless interference. <laughs> Somebody's probably got a walkie talkie. Who is it? <laughs> Well, let's see. So we're talking about how difficult it is for young boys and girls on the reservation to count coup because of all of the things they must overcome. Not to mention 150 years of government ineptness, ineptitude and repression. These kids are lucky if they finish high school, let alone get a college degree. Sometimes it just comes down to shooting hoops or being good at some sport. Today we continue our journey to become a spiritual warrior, the red feather warrior, the one who is in the prime of life, the summer of life in the south direction. That's why I'm wearing the red shirt today. So what are the things that the red feather warriors have in common? They're disciplined, both internally and externally. Without discipline, they could not stay alive long enough to be called a warrior. They develop mental focus. No one can develop essential skills of dealing with life, protecting oneself, or facing a foreboding opponent without focused attention, without a focused mind. They develop an attitude of persistence. They have to face difficulty, pain, discomfort, discouragement, fear, and the prospect of failure and utter doom without quitting. All struggles and conflict is settled in the mind before it reaches a physical resolution. If their resolve wavers, failure and defeat are certain. And finally, they train. If you don't train, you don't develop the skills that you need to survive, and you die. All of these traits apply to a spiritual warrior as well, and for the same reason. What we're looking for here at Center of Universal Life are people who are willing to take a risk, to believe that we can truly change the worldwide reality by having the courage to change ourselves. Remember, change yourself and change the world. Remember, who is our greatest enemy? The universal enemy? Ourselves? Our own self-ignorant, which is the ultimate source of suffering, right? From last week's message. The battle of the spiritual warrior is the mastery of self. A warrior does not give up what he loves. He finds the love in what he does. Remember that one from Dan Millman, author of The Peaceful Warrior? 
It is said that madness is doing the same thing day in and day out and looking for a different result. Well, there's plenty of madness in the world, isn't there? So where do you stand? Are you going to be one of the new spirit warriors? Here's some of the ways you can tell. A, spirit, a spiritual warrior recognizes that they and only they create their own reality. In other words, they live fearlessly and they embrace every person, every situation, every circumstance that they have drawn to them as their own manifestation. And they're prepared to deal with that. Remember the law of attraction? The law of attraction. You draw to yourself the schmuck. <laughs> the uh, you know, person that wants to cut in front of you. You draw them to you because they're your teachers. You love them. You love their teaching. You learn the lesson and then you move on. You deal with what you have drawn to you. And you bless it. You send it on its way. A spirit warrior realizes that fearlessness is not about being without fear. Rather, it's about continually confronting and breaking through fear in the moment it arises. Remember the word? Danger is real, but fear is a choice. Okay, I got that from a Will Smith movie. <laughs> but, it's true. A spirit warrior does not blame or judge others or themselves. Very important. Not even the crazy situations that we now witness in the world. He or she accepts the outer reality created by group karma. Yes. yes. Group karma. Our country has a karma. Every country has a karma. Every community has a karma. And we, as spiritual warriors, work tirelessly to unravel it. And remember what karma is. Having to experience what we have put others through. A spirit warrior doesn't complain or constantly try to fix the pain. They recognize that the pain is the place where the light enters. And that transcendence of the physical is the path to immortality. Therefore, they say to pain, bring it on. <laughs> A spiritual warrior is not afraid to let go of creations or manifestations that have served its purpose which could mean moving on from a de-energizing relationship, a job or a location. Even when the path forward is uncertain, they dive all in. Remember the mantra that I gave you? That's okay. Everything always works out for me. <laughs> a spirit warrior knows the difference between surrender and giving up. I like this one. Surrender is aligning with the truth that they can feel unfolding. Whereas giving up is just merely being wishy-washy and too easily accepting of anything goes. Number seven. The spirit warrior knows the difference between judgment and discernment. It's vitally important to call reality the way it is. In other words, to navigate the path between obstacles in life. But... To judge another person or a particular circumstance as always being the same is to condemn it and then form a fixed relationship to it. This leads to rigidity, which is just one step away from dying. A spirit warrior is careful with the words never and always, so it's not to condemn a particular situation to a particular fate, because as we know, always may change. A spirit warrior is not afraid to go against the herd, even that that means being trampled by it. Speak your truth. Say what you mean. Do what you say. And let that be your integrity. A spirit warrior is not afraid to suffer or to die for a cause greater than themselves. The law of suffering. Did you know there was a law of suffering? The law of suffering was defined by Mahatma Gandhi. I mean, who better, right? As the necessity of the nonviolent actor to voluntarily endure suffering as a mechanism for transforming an opponent. 
Now, I hope it doesn't come to that. I hope the transformation that we want to see to a holistic worldview does not come to this type of suffering. But if it does, I'm ready. Are you ready? The law rests on Gandhi's observation that, quote, real suffering, bravely born, melts even a heart of stone. In other words, this doesn't apply to just any suffering, but to suffering born voluntarily and without hatred against the opponent. Now that's a high calling. That's a high calling. As Martin Luther King put it, this kind of unearned suffering is redemptive, meaning that it can win people with a heart of stone over to your way of thinking. The spirit warrior knows that death is merely the passage into a new life and therefore fearlessly, li fearlessly lives the life they have now. We would like to share with you a music video now that I was honored to play flute on and become a part of. It represents a project to build a Native American veterans monument. So in the spirit of the Illumina Film Festival, we're offering you a free screening today of this four minute video. <laughs> i 
just withstand this onslaught, but to stand within. You stand within our circle of power, within our four directions that guide us, within our inner being, our inner light, our inner warrior. This is how we characterize a spiritual warrior. Someone with fierce love, raging forgiveness, blatant compassion, and flagrant generosity. Have you ever known somebody that you can actually, that when you go to meet them, you feel like they're radiating anger or bitterness, uh, resentment, long-standing disappointment? And then, of course, they want to make sure that you know. <laughs> so they, they hook your attention and they tell you their story about themselves. Well, that was my mother. <laughs> She was hardcore. There was nothing I could do to comfort, console, joke, or help her in any way that would improve her mood. After 30 minutes, she could suck the life out of a room. Oh. <laughs> I made it 45 minutes. <laughs> then I had to head to the door, get some air. Of course, I learned to have to, well, this was long ago, and I learned new tools of you know, don't expect that much when you go to visit mom. But, uh, but I realize now that it wasn't about me. It wasn't her relationship with me. It was her relationship with herself, the angry, wounded warrior inside her. And she, didn't just, she just didn't know what her gifts were. And without knowing what our gifts are, there's no way to name them. There are many tools that we can use to awaken the spiritual warrior that we are. And these are tools of, tools of choice. They can be Nam Yoga, meditation, pranayama, prayer, running, dancing, martial arts, cycling. It's a long list. You get to pick what works for you and then practice. Practice regularly and consistently. And then make love the basis of our decisions. Love is the answer. Love is always there. It is always the answer. It is always the right thing. It is always the right place to come from in every situation. So let's look at how we name our spiritual warrior self. What do you feel is your greatest gift? Is anybody familiar with Jeff Primo? He's a great uh, Qigong teacher. A very famous Qigong teacher. And... Once, uh, he said that the reason that we came here to earth was to experience the act of sharing, sharing our gift. You see, he told the story that his teachers had told him that before the earth, we just all lived together in the presence of the one mind, the source of all creation. We lived in this loving presence and wanted for nothing except one thing. The experience of sharing. You see, since all of our needs were taken care of, we had nothing to share with each other because I could only share with you what you already had. So, we went to the Creator and we asked if we could have a chance to experience what sharing felt like. And the Source said, well, I need to create a 
place where this so this can occur. It will be a place where some will have and some will not have. Are you sure you want this? And we all said, sure, yeah, yeah. Like the minions. So now we're here. You live in the desert. <laughs> a traveler comes by your place one day and asks you for a glass of water. And you say, oh no. We only have enough water for us and our livestock. We have no water to spare. So the traveler leaves and goes on his way. But you feel bad because you want to share. It's in our nature to want to share. So you decide you're going to dig a well. So you'll have water to share the next time a traveler comes by. So you begin digging a hole for a well. And you dig. And you dig. Day after day, you dig. It's hard work. It's sweaty. It's dirty. It makes your body sore and hurt. And then there's the setbacks. You've got cave-ins and tragedies happen. But you keep digging. Days turn into weeks. Weeks turn into months. Months turn into years. Which turn into more and more years and years. And still, there's no water to share. But you don't give up. And then one day, you're deep in the well. And you swing that pick. Boom! Out comes the water. Filling the well. Bubbling up. Surging. Gushing out. You celebrate and rejoice. Because now you can experience what sharing is like when someone asks you for a glass of water. You have worked long, hard days and years to find water. You have suffered. You've made mistakes. You've lost things. There's been tragedies and heartbreaks along the way. But you never gave up. And now you have a gift of life to share with others. Remember, the deeper the pain, the greater the gift. You have earned it with sweat, blood, and tears. Now you know the value of the gift because you know what it was paid for with. Now you know that the gift you have to share with others is so that you can enjoy the feeling of sharing. Maybe you're a therapist. Are you compassionate? A problem solver, an organizer, an artist, a musician, a cook, a writer, a chef. What gives you the greatest joy of sharing in life? Do you teach yoga? Do you teach meditation? Maybe you just like to share the tastiest dish with people, like your minister. <laughs> That, my friends, is the name of your spirit warrior. <laughs> Why is it so important to share our gifts? Because the smile on your face for, and the warmth that you feel when you are giving from your heart lasts a lot longer than the gift that you share. Nothing feels better than sharing, and that's frankly one reason we've changed the name of the collection plate. Huh. Really, the collection plate. It brings to mind the tax collector. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And I don't think anybody in the Old Testament enjoyed seeing the tax collector come, except maybe the king. So that's why we call it the blessing bag. We talk of sharing your financial gifts. See, these are words that involve good feelings for us, and we hope they do the same for you. Kimberly, Kimberly and I like to share it forward. You know how it is. Uh, you pay somebody's toll, you pay for an elder's dinner. You know, it, it's self-sacrifice. Yes, because you had to sacrifice yourself, your time, your energy to be able to have a gift to share. But when you do, it lifts you beyond your own worries and experiences, that satisfaction of that small selfless deed that hopefully leads to a ripple effect and bigger impacts along the way. But I have to warn you, this kind of sharing can be addictive. We really enjoy it. Because of our lifestyle and the fact that we were traveling full time for 13 years, we did a lot of traveling on I-10, back and forth, you know, east to west. Mm -hmm. One of the places we would like to stop at frequently before we got back into Arizona was, was in New Mexico. Was uh, Deming, New Mexico, a small town. 
but the best mechanic, the best diesel mechanic we've ever had, works there. He has a shop there. So we pull up in front of his shop you know, the night before, camp there. The next morning, we're the first in line. He works on our motor home. We go on our way. So one uh, this happened last November. We were we stopped there overnight. The next day was Thanksgiving. So I think we were probably watching football on the satellite TV when we got a knock on the door. You know, it's usually police when that happens. <laughs> but this time there was a, a white-haired man standing out there next to his car, and I went out to talk to him, and he was uh, asking us, well, have you had Thanksgiving dinner yet? And I said, no, we'll probably go to a restaurant later on, something like that. He says, well, I have two Thanksgiving dinners in the back of my car that I've made special for people that I know are not going to be with their families today. So he gave us these two dinners. And I swear, they were the best. They were the best. So, he was sharing what he loved to do, what he was good at. And we just happened to be the ones, bless the path, that gift of his. So everyone is born with a special gift, but we have to find out what it is. It could show up as an innate talent or personality trait. Um, but I would say that if it comes easy to you, then it's probably not your true gift. Your true gift is something you're going to have to earn, you're going to have to pay for. Or otherwise, how would you know the value of your gift and what it was worth in sharing it? From my own experience, I would have to say that your gift will have, since it comes from your heart, will have to be something that makes your heart sing. Something that you just really love doing. In sharing our gifts with others, it kind of triggers them to want to share their gift too. And that's just creates a domino effect, a really uh, sends out a ripple of good vibration, of good energy. Imagine that if everyone here in this room were doing that, above all, nourishing our own gifts and noticing the gifts of others, that's what a spiritual warrior does. Spiritual warriors have learned to let go and not sweat the small stuff. There's no need for seeking revenge. In, in, for anything that anybody does that seems to be a wrongdoing towards us, there's only the need to learn the lesson and move on without repeating the same mistake. When we don't remember who we are as a spiritual warrior, we become human yo-yos. When life is good, we're happy. When life is difficult, or not. I'm a storyteller by nature. And I've learned that my, in my performances the power that a story has to change a life. But by creating a story of peace, compassion, and forgiveness, we learn how to tell the story of ourselves as a spiritual warrior, transforming our own lives and those around us profoundly. We can create a better world for our children, our families, our friends, and those we know, and those we don't know. Those we like and those we don't like. Those who are good to us and those who are not. It's a spiritual warrior. We can treat them all the same. We can treat them with the love that is coming out of the flame that burns within us. My point is this, the story that we tell ourselves is the story that we live. So I'm challenging you all right here and now to tell yourself the story that you are a spiritual warrior. Become the spiritual warrior and don't let anyone else rewrite your story for you. Thank you. Let's close our eyes now and pray. Kit.
hypnotize yourself into unconditional self-love. Where there is love, there is no fear. When there's no fear, there's no anger. Hypnotize yourself into that relationship with yourself. Self-love has no conditions. It is satnam, which means that our essence is the essence. The great mystery is who we are. <coughs> I see your true nature. I recognize the divinity in you. So in gratitude we give thanks to all the helping spirits. We give thanks to our ancestors who gave us life. We give thanks to the earth, air, water, the land and sun for sustaining us. We give gratitude to the hidden folk in nature. And we give thanks to the spirit that lives in all things, all life forms that live on this great earth and surround us here in Arizona. We thank them, knowing that whatever they have shared, their energy will continue to deepen in us and continue to heal us. To Mother Earth, we say, I love you. We hold you in our hearts, and we hold you and continue to hold a positive vision for you. We give thanks our circle. We give thanks for our lives. We are a vessel of light. We are a vessel of healing. We are a vessel of prayer. Today we plant a seed, a blessing, a word into our inner garden and into our earth garden and make a commitment nourish the seed with love so it will grow and blossom into great beauty for all life. Put your hands on your heart and feel it beating. Feel your love for life. Your garden, our circle, and the earth. You are connected to the earth and the sky. And through your heart, you are the bridge earth and heaven. Let us all enter into that silence.